<laughs> I think if I tell my son that, that now, later. it might come true. Um, well, for those of you who just listened to me babble, I am sitting socially distant, sadly, but sitting with one of the great minds that I have the pleasure of knowing and befriending the divine Donna Honeycutt. <laughs> now, I'm going to let Donna tell her own story because women should always be given the space to tell their own story. But I do have to tell you that sometimes you meet people and you're like, oh yeah, that's my kind of person. <laughs> And that's how I felt when I met Donna. Um, what she, I felt when I met you? I know, synergy, hooray! Women I'm are the what can you say? So I am thrilled to brag and, and celebrate all of Donna's brilliant accomplishments. But before we go too deep, and because I can't do justice to the breadth and oh. depth of your work, please tell our vast and growing array of listeners, who you are, what you do, and why you do it. You bet. Um, so I started my career as an attorney. I did mergers and acquisitions. Um, and then I, and I did all sorts of uh, structured finance and all sorts of financial contracts and stuff, um, which uh, was really interesting to me. I occupy a very nerdy part of the world that loves the intersection of numbers and words, right? How does the contract affect the numbers? How does the regulation affect the incentives? And, and all of that combined with human behavior. So, um, you know, I represented acquirers, I represented targets, um, I numericized everything, um, and I, I, again, nerds, right? I'm really into, like, the, the details of that stuff. Um, and then I met a, a Navy officer who um, swept me off my feet, and here I was in love, and uh, Navy being Navy, we needed to move every three years. So I found myself leaving New York City and leaving financial law, um, and I wanted something more human, um, and so I ended up taking a job in Boston as an immigration attorney, specifically for business immigration. Um, and I loved it. And then we got orders once again that were completely unexpected, total bait and switch, classic Navy story. Found myself in Italy, which I know boohoo, right? But um, found myself in Italy, but without a job. This was before uh, people really working online and had it been maybe a year or two later, I think I would have just kept working from Italy, um, ran into my business partner on a tour bus and she was desperately looking for a job. I was going to write a novel. Um, we ended up teaching an entire MBA curriculum together, except for one class where they had to fly in an accountant because I said, I'm not teaching accounting. I don't have a CPA. Um, but we taught the whole, we graduated an entire class of MBAs um, and we did it largely by staying a couple chapters ahead of the students, right? I came at, at it from a business law perspective. Lauren came at it from the human behavior perspective. Um, and we found that we worked really well together. And I set up a company for Lauren to be a consultant. Um, and I was never going to work. Um, so Lauren, very uh, after about a year, got a contract for herself to do some analytical stuff. She worked at the White House. Um, and, and she had this background. Um, she got a contract for herself and before it started, two things happened. Um, I had a baby with colic and I was dying and she was asked for another half body. So she said, you know, do, do you want to work with me on this contract? And I said, Lauren, I will do whatever you want if you pay me enough for any money because I was about to lose it with, I, I don't know how many of your viewers have gone through colic. It is a life changing. I mean, I've almost, I've had physical things where I've almost died. Colic was worse. So mercifully, um, this all worked out really well. Uh, I would work from, let me think, I'd work from noon to six. And then I'd, I'd start uh, working on getting the baby to sleep, which never really worked. The baby never slept. Um, and then I'd stay up with the baby all night until eight in the morning. And at eight in the morning, my nanny would knock at the door, take the baby. And then I'd sleep from eight until noon. And then I'd start all over again. And this was how my participation in WWC Global started. Um, 
Well, fast forward 16, 17 years, we went from being a, you know, I want a job for myself kind of firm to, hey, we are employing 300 people plus another 150 subcontractors responsible for a lot of people's, um, you know, personal revenue, which is a big responsibility. Um, but having learned a whole lot and having, I hope, ref refined my abilities as a technician, as a problem solver, as someone that can make something, you know, blue for this guy and red for that guy and green for that guy, you know, all ethically and legally um, in a way that you know, that, that's really management, right, is walking that tightrope between what everyone is asking for and trying to be responsive to all of the demands that are coming in at your, uh, at your company. So it's been a lot of fun. And, you know, and every time that we would get a process set up and we would get it institutionalized and we, you know, sometimes we would get a staff member to do it and we go, <clears throat> okay, but that's done now. Well, the definition of growth is not... Uh, no problems. The definition of growth is new problems. And, you know, it's a blessing. I'm not going to complain about it. But at every stage in growth, there were more things that we'd never done before and needed to respond to. And at every stage of growth, there was this tension between, well, this is how it's done, which a lot of people tell us how it's done. A lot of people that had never done it. <laughs> and a lot of people that maybe didn't know the firm and its peculiarities. Um, and then, well, what's our vision? And what would we do? And let's let's sort of throw out that MBA playbook. What are we looking for in this company? And um, at each point along the way, what we were looking for in the company was we wanted to build the company we would have liked to work for ourselves. And uh, it started by recognizing that there were all these incredibly highly credentialed military spouses around us that just didn't have an opportunity to work. And they had law school or, you know, law school loans, business school loans, college loans, whatnot and and we saw over and over again these conversations around the kitchen table of like okay he gets his six years to pay off his ROTC scholarship and then we're out because I need to go pay off my loans and as someone who is really invested in this country and the, the health of this country um I we instantly saw that as a retention problem um and the leadership at that time was about 20 years behind where sort of the younger officers were that's changed a lot since then um but we saw an opportunity, this, this untapped labor pool made the company. I mean, the talents of these women made the company. We were so lucky, right? Our first hires were amazing. And we said, well, wait a minute, this is really working. Let's keep doing this. And so we were just so fortunate to have this labor pool of incredible people that nobody else was employing. Um, and we got them all for ourselves. And then as we grew and as we uh, sort of spread our operations around the world, we would have these same people relocate. And so for them, the value proposition was, not only do you get to have a job, which was like a luxury for a lot of these military spouses, you get to actually get career progression, salary progression, a real responsibility to, to the point where, you know, a whole lot of the, the people, and they were mostly women, that started with us as junior analysts are now running the company, uh, you know, in the C-suite as, you know, leaders of entire divisions, et cetera, et cetera. That's so, and, and just as an aside, I would think that has to strengthen the, obviously it strengthens the military as a whole, but also think about the family units that are strengthened. I mean, that's just really, so it's very it's 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 very mission based and, and and it's personal and that's probably one of the reasons why it's so darn successful and successful it is. Um, but one of the things that stops a lot of people from pursuing a dream is a lot of times they dream of working with their with their best friend or close friend. Uh, my husband practices law with a dear friend of his, and for years they were like should we shouldn't we it was like this kind of like awkward dating dance and it turned out to be one of the most beautiful synergetic relationships not not that you and lauren are there's no healthy relationship that's not without discourse or conflict but you have done it really well and have such a great what i admire most is your mutual respect for each other and your gifts and there's no ego. You're like, oh, Donna is the Donna is the one for, and, and you're like, well, this is Lauren. She is. This is her bailiwick. So, I think that's a tremendous strength. But how? Do
does one in your worldview work successfully with a close personal friend? That's a, a really good question. And uh, I will say that the reason that I sort of took this on in the first place, and um, I actually suggested to Lauren that we be partners because I had all the experience and all the stuff that she didn't. And she was really fantastic at the uh, sort of that spearheading piece of it. And I was really practiced at tidying up everything and kind of making that reality real and, and, and documented and defensible after the fact. Um, and the reason that worked well together was because we had a history of working together. So when we had taught this MBA class, we passed the baton back and forth. We have tremendously different styles. You know, Lauren shoots from the hip and she's spontaneous. And I am, you know, I am the technician. I want to make sure the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. I love strategy. Um, but the way that I do strategies is, is, is a lot of spreadsheeting and a lot of creativity drawing from regulatory regimes and stuff. Um, Lauren's creativity is much more person oriented. She has all that stuff, don't get me wrong. She has all, all of what we do technically, but her tremendous gift is really sort of seeing third ways that, that other people don't see that make people happy, which is huge. Um, one of the things that we did from the beginning, the forming of the firm is we made a no friends and family rule and I think that was the smartest thing we could have ever done because as business partners, we were already somewhat tested. We knew what we were getting into. We'd worked together. It had been really successful. Um, however, what happens is, is when you own a company, inevitably, people are going to ask you for jobs. You know, dad doesn't have anything to do. You know, maybe you can give him a couple of hours and, you know, you know, it, and, and, Making that rule from the very beginning was the best possible thing we could do. Our, our rule was if we'd worked with someone before and could vouch for their professionalism, then that kind of friend we'll take, but, but nothing else, right? We're not going to mix our personal lives with our business lives. And that was really, really smart. And, but the, the conundrum there is we had very enmeshed personal lives. And so that created a lot of trust between us as well. Um, you know, we were very involved with each other's kids and such and, and really, really close friends. Um, and then what happened over the course of a lot of years is work became so consuming that it was very hard for us to be talking and not talk about work. And there became more work than there were hours in the day. So then we had to sort of carve out like the weekends, <laughs> you know, or, 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 or whatever it is, because uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week of work is, is just too much and it would overwhelm anyone. So then we got to the point where in order to preserve the trust, we also needed to do things that were strictly social. And I will tell you, that it's really hard. When 10 to 12 hours of your day is shared, how can you not talk about that when you're like going to get your nails done, you know? So, so it's a, it's, it's a fine line and it's a balance, but um, it really worked for us. And I think the key to that was that we had worked together before because I have some fantastic friends that I couldn't work with. And I can tell you, my husband's amazing. I could never work with him, right? We, too much. So, so we, it had already been tested and tried. And so I, I would advise anyone that's looking to going into business with a friend to work with them first before they really commit. Before you go all in. Yeah. No, and I, that sounds like healthy boundaries, which I think if we've learned nothing over the last year, healthy boundaries are indeed healthy and important. And, you know, and, not all relationships have to be the same. People can be inspired by the work y'all have done and not have not manifest their vision in the same way. And so again, that's why that's so that information is so valuable. Um so WWC Global has a a philosophy, a catchphrase, a value statement however a mission you you would tell me but where y'all say you are putting good government into practice 
I know what I hear when I read it, but what does that mean to you personally? So, um, you know, it's funny, before this conversation, we were having a different conversation about nationalism and love of country and, and commitment to something bigger than yourself. Um, I think Lauren and I came at that equally from different perspectives. I, I came at it from, you know, when I was doing business immigration, I was I thought this is strengthening the country. I love what I'm doing. There's a point to it. There's a, you know, there, there's a logic to it. There's something that makes this country better. Um, and Lauren was working at the Office of Management and Budget doing the same thing. Um, and initially, I think Lauren had thought about potentially, uh, uh, well, she was going to be a government administrator, which she was, and then she was going to be uh, potentially a politician. And I was an attorney and deeply, deeply committed, and, and as goofy as it sounds, but it goes back to the nerdiness, deeply committed to constitutionalism. Like, this matters to me. Right. This is something I'm part of this something bigger than myself. And so as a result, you know, and, and, and I'll say I took a semester's worth of business courses at Columbia when I got bored in law school. Um, those business folks. Okay. Yeah, that the fact that you just said you got bored in law school and picked up, you know, <laughs> at some lightweight, lightweight institution like Columbia. If you all didn't pick up on the fact that Donna is seven steps ahead of the average bear that should tell you right there because most people don't watch that, that's just fine. Lie. so carry on sorry that just draws reverence to your your incredible intellect that's very kind appreciate it um but but what we were doing you know we were very mission driven from the very beginning and and what i was going to say about business school was i was just so impressed with the people i ran into at columbia business school but the thing that was bigger than themselves were the numbers I did not run into a lot of idealists. I did not run into a lot of mission-driven people. I ran into people that are now captains of industry and doing amazing things. But I was in the law school, right? I didn't you know, go in to make as much dollars as possible. And certainly Lauren didn't either. And again, we started the company not to make a lot of money. We started the company to have jobs. And, and, then, and then as we refined sort of the idea of the, com the company, it was, we want a company that would be like the bosses we wish we had when we had started our careers. And then after that, it was, we really want this company to facilitate a path forward for credentialed military spouses when they PCS so that we want to have operations in every Navy port so that as the husbands get promoted, the wives come along and get promoted with us. Um, and then after that, it was, now we want to diversify. We want to bring in the veteran community. Um, and, and at each step, there was a concept that was a numerical. Um, and so when we say put good government into practice, that it's really comprised of two things. The first is, well, three things. The first is, is I think how we, are, Lauren and I are both hardwired to care about things being right and to support our country. It sounds goofy, sounds dorky, but we, we care, we care, right? Um, and then the, 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 the second piece of it comes from the people that we engage, right? When you engage a military spouse, when you engage a veteran, you don't have to worry about their attitude. You don't have to worry about how invested they are in a good outcome for the government. It's, it's automatic. It's already there. So that made our hiring so much easier and so much more successful, right? And then the third piece of that is, is we both pride ourselves, I think, on um, being realists and being uh, very open to different perspectives, but that there is a truth. And so the company's internal tagline is credibility. And we always said, um, you know, the one thing that will get you fired in this firm, it's not uh, trying new things. It's not failing, even though you tried hard. It's not, but dishonesty or uh, something unethical, that's gonna get you fired in this firm. And, and that's how we've differentiated ourselves from the rest of our competitors, which is we're not the cheapest. Um, we may, you know, I think we're the best, but that's totally subjective. Um, but, but we absolutely can tell you that we will never upsell you. We will never kind of go around and try to find ways to get more money from you. We will deliver what we promise at the very least and hopefully more.
So, you know, the whole ethos of the company is to underpromise and overdeliver. Um, and that's where that slogan comes from. That's awesome. And, and again, I don't think it's dorky at all, the, the love <laughs> and all that. Because I deeply, regardless of party, regardless, I think when, when government works well, it's beautiful. And, you know, There's, I, yeah. it's just it's so exciting and inspiring. And look, when we have humans in place, there's going to be flaws. And I, I, I really, I no longer believe in polling because we found that that's not an accurate source. But I tell you what, I have, I don't know what it is. I don't know if I give off some vibe, but every Lyft driver I have always talks to me about their politics and it's always very different and their perception. And I just take it in because I feel like I'm hearing the stories of the people who are being affected by it. And it's not my bias and it's not them trying to pander to my belief system or challenge my belief system. And it's such a wonderful way to see how we can do things better and what true public service is, which I think is good and noble. And I, I have great deal of respect for it. Um, and it's also, it, it, it's, it's so much more complicated than you know, the 30 second sound bites would want us to believe. But I, again, I find that to be beautiful about both of you. Um, obviously y'all are passionate both for personal reasons, but because you've seen the impact of powering military spouses. And how much do you think that has impacted, not just your business, because obviously you've spoke brilliantly to the fact that, I mean, it was, an, it was a no-brainer, um, the, the, the intangibles and, and those values that, that y'all hold so dear, dear. But, but how much do you think understanding that and seeing that before really anybody else, making military spouses, elevating them and creating opportunities for them, the impact of that on our entire Department of Defense? I can't even imagine it's measurable, but like just observationally things that you've seen, how that strengthened, not just our country, but our families. Well, I'll say that I don't believe that we elevated military spouses. I, the only thing I think we did is we recognized that they were there and they were an amazing labor source. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about was uh, routinely when we were starting with the whole issue with military spouses, because then uh, we built a nonprofit that supported the employment of military spouses as a retention objective uh, that got folded into the U.S. Chamber of Commerce hiring our heroes. Um, but what we always said from the very beginning, you know, initially when, when we started working with hiring our heroes, their poster child was a young woman in a white t-shirt standing in front of a white picket fence with her hand on her heart. And I was like, my employees don't wear white t-shirts and they don't stand in front of their white picket fence. They're at a table, right? They're at a desk, they're in front of a computer, they're on a telephone and they're wearing professional, you know, word gear. And, and, and it's so funny, like how impactful that image is, it changed over the years and rightly so, because at the time that we started, we actually went and talked uh, to the SES for uh, family quality of life or whatever it was over at Stuttgart at UCOM. And he said, I am all for military spouse employment. They make great secretaries. And this whole concept of employing military spouses was being peddled as, you know, your patriotic duty, like a charity. And I don't take well to being treated as a charity. <laughs> and, you know, let me tell you that my, to this day, my compliance director, who is a Yale and Harvard grad, uh, does not think that her salary is charity. And let me tell you, it's not because she is worth it in spades, right? Um, so changing that, I think, was really important. Um, I think part of it was us. And, and the funny story is, is that where we started on a Navy base in Naples, Italy, it got to the point where every professionally dressed woman was just assumed to be one of our people. And mind you, at the time, uh, the admirals would call us Wiener Corp. Yeah. What? Wiener Corp. 
because the attractive women, right? Like these are all women in their 20s and 30s and they're all dressed professionally and they're all walking along the spine of the base. And that was such a novelty that of course some of the government uh, offices said, well, wait a minute, why aren't I hiring this workforce? And they started to, and they changed the rules so that you could hire executive level professionals on ground rather than having to recruit them from the US and then move them out and pay their moving bills and pay for the kids' schools and all that. They already, this labor force was, was on the ground. It was brilliant, it was talented. And so, so some of these military offices saw that right away. Um, and so they did that. And then the other thing that happened was the command level uh, sailors, um, they started turning over. We started to get admirals that had working lives. We started to get junior officers that had, you know, working lives and, and in some cases working husbands with careers and with credentials and with student loans. And we saw firsthand, because that was my generation within the Navy, how that was affecting who the Navy got to keep. And I will tell you that some of the most professionally energetic and ambitious spouses are married to some of the most professionally ambitious, energetic, and intellectual active duty troops. Now, when the military is investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in their specialized education for a particular Navy function, doesn't it make sense to try to preserve them in the Navy, right? It was kind of a no brainer once you started living it. And uh, so we started this nonprofit organization because at a certain point we realized there are so many more talented spouses here than we can hire, right? It was always feast or famine either. We didn't have enough positions for all the great spouses or we got a new contract and we couldn't find that squirrel that we needed to um, or like we're going to develop this because this is a whole community and and in some places uh we developed a community that wasn't about work because literally there was no work around so fort polk for example i made a visit out to fort polk i met a woman named amy bontrager and she said i i'm dying i like my professional self is dying here and there's no work to be had. I mean, Fort Polk is really out in the middle of nowhere and there's, there's no industry around there. Um, and I said, okay, well, why don't you uh, start a chapter of the organization here at the time it was called In Gear Career and make it a business book club. At the time, Lean In had just come out. So I said, make Lean In your first book. And then at least you have a sense of community with other like-minded military spouses. Um, P.S. She now works at the White House. So, and is deeply, deeply involved in the, you know, she ended up at the Hiring Her Harris program and now at the White House. Um, so the community was there, it needed a catalyst to come together. And then we just needed that evolution of the generations to, to change all that. And, and the day that Hiring Our Heroes changed their poster child from a, you know, a young woman in a white t-shirt at a picket fence to someone in a suit, uh, I was really happy. And, yeah. and oh, and then it was championed by Michelle Obama, and then it was championed by uh, um, Mrs. Pence, and then uh, it is now championed and has been championed for years by Dr. Biden. Um, it was really a no-brainer, and, and all it needed was a bit of a megaphone. That's awesome. And, and again, mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing but good there, and, and I just think it's... Well, that's my, my nerdy technocrat. I love unleashing efficiencies, right? For me, as you know, what we do is management consulting, looking at this incredible workforce on the ground and seeing that they're not productively employed for me, that's a waste. And that's a technical misfit that needs to, you know, you need to release the efficiencies in there. So I guess this is a business case, right? This the, the premise of hiring military spouses was wrongly presented as a charity. It's not. It's going to make you successful. It's going to build your company. It built mine. I owe everything I have to, to this workforce. Um, and it sure as heck isn't charity. It's, if anything, I have them to thank in space. Well, and no matter your business, the hiring process and onboarding process is the most expensive. So if you can retain yes. talent in the military and inspire and fulfill their gifted spouses and partners, then I mean, how is that not just brilliant? 
That's exactly right. And then there was an executive order. The Obama administration issued an executive order allowing uh, people to hire military spouses at the particular duty station that they were at with their active duty spouses um, by name, so long as they were qualified. And, you know, what that did was, my God, did that save a lot for the military by engaging people that were already devoted to the mission, already enmeshed in, in the local uh, military installation, already with the vocabulary, already with the, uh, you know, most of these military spouses, sure, they work for the money, but they also, how wonderful is it to be able to work, again, for a cause that you believe in and sleep well at night? And that was all automatic with this particular labor force. And perhaps a short commute as well. <laughs> That's a big one. Which is, you know, infrastructure. Talk about nerding out. I love talking That's, about how. Oh, you're exactly right. You're exactly. I mean, we've seen that with COVID this last year. I think it's completely changed the landscape. And I think uh, the military spouse situation has been dramatically improved by the acceptance of work from home. And the efficiencies yeah. there, that was something we used since 2005. I mean, we were distributed from 2005. We never had a you know, physical headquarters other than my upstairs for, for you know, 15 years. Now we have an office that we rent for meetings, but um, you know, we've been doing this all along. And, it, and, and, and instead of losing out by people not being there physically, we've actually been able to segregate them to focus on their work at their homes where they're most comfortable minimize their commute. I mean, my commute is 45 seconds a day, right? <laughs> Up the stairs, down the stairs. Um, and then to save the meetings for times that are structured and important and with a particular objective and, and really, really quality. That's awesome. So we now know what you became and or are constantly becoming, because I don't think we ever, I hope we never stop evolving. Right. But yeah. when you were a little kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? So when I was a little kid, I wanted to be Sheila E. living the glamorous life. I wanted to, you know, be someone who does math in their head and all sorts of exotic business stuff. And, uh, you know, I always imagined myself living in New York City, which is why I went to law school in New York City and why I got into M&A and structured finance. Um, I just had that vision of, of, like, how glamorous would that be to be, like, a businesswoman who can add long rows of numbers in her head and, and you know, keep, you know, a, a lid on all these other things at, at, at the same time. P.S. I think I'm probably undiagnosed ADD. So that worked out really well as well. <laughs> so There's so like, a professor it says that that helps with productivity. Um, and, you know, did you ever have any dreams since you're now a very famous podcaster um, <laughs> what, what did you add have any entertainment dreams and then also please tell everyone where they can find your podcast which people go nuts for and find it incredibly valuable for both a learning standpoint of how because the world you work in is it's it's, it's, it's a different language it's a different it's a lot of things and you all have graciously said we're going to guide you because you have to stop calling us because we have work to do. Um, and, <laughs> but we shall share generously. And then also, you know, just, just educating folks. So, um, so you are in the entertainment industry with a national global podcast. Um, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> Slightly alarming. Hey. I left Los Angeles oh. because I have no interest in the entertainment industry. Well, Maybe you'll just redefine it the way you've done everything else y'all have done. Make it better. Um, where do they find your podcast and what's it called and all the fun stuff? Okay, so the podcast is called Winning with Connections. And in each episode, we talk to some expert or someone with a great story to tell about um, building something or perfecting something as a small business defense contractor. Um, again, we're trying to unleash efficiencies and save for other people the headache of, of what it took us banging into a wall and then having to redo things to do. Um, there really isn't with, with um, federal government, especially defense contracting, until recently there wasn't any book that told you how to do it. And there's so many arcane pieces. And again, that, you know, that nerdy, balkanized knowledge. Um, but we thought, 
you know, I, we still, we're about to grow out of small business status, but we really, again, something bigger than ourselves. We, we want to encourage, I, and I'll tell you what I think is really important about small business for the, for the federal government is, is if small business is not nurtured and if small business is uh, left to the market forces that inevitably will just buy everything great and then incorporate it kind of into the, the oligarchy that, that currently serves the defense space, um, we're never going to cultivate sort of those next contenders. And, and, and as a, I'd like to think of myself as a business economics expert from, from the point of view of having represented large firms and small firms and the purchasing of firms, uh, you know, the economic sense there is uh, to sort of crap out at the end of the small business and sell um, because there's something that's called the valley of death, where going into the mid-tier level, you're now competing with the Boeings and the Lockheeds of this world. Um, well, we'd like to be able to build a bridge over that valley of death and make sure that you know all of these small firms are cultivated appropriately to be really, really powerful when they reach that mid-tier level and maybe even potentially to if we figure this out as we crack this nut, and I think we will, um, help them with a bridge across the valley of death at the mid-tier level. I'm not shocked that it's a woman-owned business that is trying to help people safely get across something known as the valley of death. <laughs> and, and in a way that is both positive, collaborative, and willing to share for success for all, um, which is why support women-owned businesses and celebrate um, women in business and their success, especially now because COVID has made it even more difficult. Okay, you've been really generous with your time. Most people would, would you know, be willing to lob off a small um, and appendage for, for this much of your time. So my last question is, and it's an homage to my obsession with my favorite TV show, The West Wing, which I have watched more times than than, than should be noted. Um, I, Aaron Sorkin and I have something going that he's on. <laughs> I feel very deeply. Um, and for those of you who are not viewers, number one, become viewers. And number two, you know, when they move on, when the next thing is, they always say, what's next? So you just talked about the bridge, but, and maybe that's the what's next, but, or maybe it's something in your personal life or a dream or whatever, but Donna, what is your what's next? So, so we have been thinking strategically about that mid tier level. We're there. Um, we have built this beautiful machine that we've codified and memorialized what I think are some amazing best practices and best ways to do business in this particular sector. Um, and the whole objective of that was always at every stage to amplify our ability to go carve out and build the next level. So um, we are going to continue to do that. Uh, thank God we have this just tremendous staff supporting us. Um, personally, I have kids that are about to go to college in two years and that's kind of making me freak out because the 12 hour days and the 14 hour days, I mean, I saved the commutes. So I was able to see my kids every night cause I was working upstairs. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sort of, and I, I recently turned 50. So uh, thinking about like, okay, what, what is next? And it, it's something that um, I'd love to talk with you about in a different conversation. Yeah, so maybe we'll stay tuned and have breaking news in a future episode. But um, Donna's got to go save the world and employ all the brilliant talent. Um, but more than anything, and I'll make sure that we put links to the company because you all are always hiring. And it's also really important that we share the stories of these incredible businesses that were built out of the grit and determination of smart women. And there is nothing I find more magnificent than that. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time, your generosity, your leadership, both in our community and within your company, and for fr quite frankly, being just a really delightful human being. So we love Donna here at See Her Soar, and she, she's not even halfway through the rise. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 
You bet. That guy just want to thank you for everything you're doing to showcase all the different ways that women can succeed and elevate themselves, not be elevated, right? We all have a lot of talents inside. It's just an issue of keep trying until you, you run into the path where you can amplify it. Amen, sister friend. And on that note, we're signing out.